The Ideas Incubator continues on the series about exploratory data analysis uh, with the tidyverse and expanded family because we're also talking about our markdown documents today and doesn't like, strictly belong to the tidyverse organization. But, uh, but uh, well, last time actually we started with a preliminary meetup which uh, covered some of those things that belong to more like your setting, uh, your setup of uh, your toolkit, um, and uh, you know that makes your workflow, uh, mm, you know, more useful, less error prone. And today, actually, I wanted to kick off with the exploration of the data, but you know, we are still uh, in need to at least you know overview some of the main tools that we're going to be using in the series. So I don't think we're going to actually get to exploring data yet. But uh, so before I, I keep talking, let me share my screen because I forgot to do that. Um, and also, let's see, Faria, I think you were the first joining today. Uh, could you help me? Shut up at 20 past. If you remember, yeah. just, just mention the time or something. I usually remember these days, but the fact that I, I assign someone to kick me out makes me remember that I have to actually stop talking. So great. Um, so we, can you see my screen now? Yes. Oh, cool. So yeah, the idea is today to talk about the data sign workflow in general even without you know thinking about the tools, what is that a data scientist does um, at work, and then actually get you know quickly into the toolkit and overview very 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 quickly um, the main tools that we are going to be talking about in this series. There is a lot more uh, tools that you might want to learn about, and probably the best way to learn that is to read the data science, the R for data science book by Hadley Wickham, which is the book that is um, uh, inspiring this series, in particular chapter seven, the one about exploratory, exploratory data analysis. But yeah, today let's talk about basically what's the workflow uh, and then introduce our Markdown documents and introduce the two main tools for exploring data. Uh, Digiplot2, which is going to be our tool for visualization, and Deplier, which is going to be our tool for transforming data. Um, so with that, I'm going to now jump to the document that is going to guide our, our meetup. So first, I want to introduce like this image, which is at the very beginning, I think, of the R4 Data Science book that uh, very nicely captures the distinct steps um, in the work of a data scientist. So usually you import the data from the world. You may be scraping data from the web, you may be importing a CSV file that you have in your computer, you may be reading a database, whatever. Usually that data doesn't come perfect as you wish. Uh, then uh, you may need to tidy that data in some way. And uh, we're gonna be actually talking about a very formal definition of what tidy data means in the context of the tidyverse. There may be other definitions, but that is a, a good, useful definition for us. And then you enter this gray area uh, where um, uh, it's kind of an iterative process. You know, once you have tidy data, you are uh, now able to deploy all the tools for exploratory data analysis, tools like Deplier that allow you to transform your data, tools like ggplot2 that allow you to visualize your data and other tools to model your data and extract patterns that might contain that your data might contain and you might be interested in understanding or even extracting to see what remains after you remove some pattern and then you know once you 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 know went into that loop a few times you will kind of walk away with some new understanding of your data and you may need to well, you usually you need to communicate that to others or even to yourself. Sometimes, you know, just the idea of, of making that process explicit and capturing it in writing just helps you clarify your own thinking and helps kind of move at, in a very focused way towards an answering the, the research questions that you may uh, have in your head. Or sometimes you start blank, you don't even know what to ask your data because you don't know what insights that data may contain. So exploratory data analysis does that, allows you uh, to have, you know, it gives you a system to, you know, start 
uh, generating questions and then uh, you know using the tools that we're going to be talking about today uh, you can start answering those questions and that you know as you move in answering one question you may have many other new questions that you might want to explore and that's the idea so uh, the um, tools that we are going to be overviewing today are tools for communication first i'm going to be talking about this special flavor of our file that is called our markdown file then I'm going to be talking about the tool to visualize, da to visualize data, which is a tool called ggplot2 that comes from a, you know, a collection of packages or a family of packages called the Tidyverse. And then uh, we're, I'm also going to be talking about dplyr, which is the tool that allows you to transform data. We are going to be leaving you know, outside some tools um, today and in the series as well. But even with a few things that we're going to be uh, covering in this series, you will be able to explore your data quite deeply. So there is not a lot that you need in terms of tooling to extract useful insights from your data. So let me jump now to our studio and show you uh, what are uh, our Markdown documents. Um, just by the way, you know, I'm sure that a lot of uh, you may already be using these tools today. So uh, even for those, I think that, you know, Jackson and I recently, you know, went through a, a, a workshop that, you know, um, delivered this content in a more expanded way. And uh, even when, you know, we entered the, the workshop thinking that we knew it all, then we realized that, you know, making it kind of formal uh, taught us a number of things. Hopefully, even if you have experience with these tools, uh, the way that we're going to be thinking about those tools today will give us like a new way or new perspective about the same tools that we already know. And if you don't know the tools, then great, you know, uh, you know, hopefully this will be your shortcut to kind of learning the, the minimum things that you need to know for success. So let's go to our studio. Um, I'm going to start opening a new file. So I'm going to go to file, new file. And I'm going to go to our markdown. Uh, this is something you can do yourself. Uh, if you just, you know, follow the defaults, you will uh, create a template, uh, a new R markdown file that allows you to actually learn about R markdown files. You know, the template that you get is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, so I'm going to overview it very quickly. But the very first thing you will, you will want to do is uh, just click this uh, blue button there is called knit um, and uh, you will need to save it let's do a test rmd and save that file so when you save it then what you get is in the viewer panel the output of running knit on that file so that file has a, a few sections that are kind of interesting the very first section is called the yaml header uh, that header will define, for example, the type of document that you're using. Now we asked for a type of document that is called HTML, but I usually like a different flavor of document. I like the, the document that's called GitHub document. Then there is a section that, and the title is not compulsory, so you could remove it if you wanted. Uh, then there is a section for setup. Uh, usually, uh, you know, the setup that you get is kind of just fine. Echo equals true means that um, that you will see code that you write inside these code chunks that are defined by this weird syntax. It's back tick, back tick, back tick. You know, curly braces are blah blah blah. It's kind of weird, but yeah, it is what it is. Uh, and you can insert new chunks just by going here, click there, and you say. R and that inserts a new R chunk, empty. And then inside that you can write code. And then the beauty of this file is that is you know the, the reason why it's so powerful for communication is because it allows you to mix prose and code. And that's great because you can explain something in words and then right next to those words you have a code chunk and then you have more words and then more code and then more words and more code. So that generates this kind of um, a document right that uh, where the code and the prose is, is next to each other and that is a very uh, useful 
to understand your thinking process and accompany that with the actual code that runs. Because you, not only you see the, the code, which is here somewhere, you know, shown in gray, but also see the output. So basically anything that you, it, it could be printed to your console appears here in the document itself. So for example, if you, if you typed this, you know, words, uh, summary cars on the console, let's run that, you can see output, right? So exactly that output that would go to your screen, that is the output that goes here in the, uh, you know, behind the chunks. So uh, as I explained our Markdown documents, I also kind of use this as an opportunity to kind of show you how I like them most. You don't have to, you know, use my ways, but, um, but you can. So if you say equal uh, equal equals false instead of uh, the output uh, instead of seeing the code and the output you only see the output as you can see here but you don't see the code that generated it so in general what you want is equals true um, and that's it for now I, I, I don't want to confuse you more uh, it's great because also it allows you to add you know links to places it allows you to introduce figures for example this code chunk will produce a figure and if i scroll down here here you see how the figure is there okay why i like um the this type of document the github document i like it because when you click knit it doesn't create a html file instead it creates a, a file called md markdown and that file is uh, very cleverly displayed on GitHub uh, as a web page. So I'm going to show you uh, what I mean by that. Uh, so if I if I'm here, like in this file, for example, let me open the file that hosts the today's meetup. So this is the file that I created to you know for for the meetup today. If I knit this file, what I see here on my viewer in a moment is the file that uh, I showed you in the beginning of this meetup. I can go to this, you know, I can open the MD file how, now here, which is is, a, an, is an output of, of hitting NIT on the RMD file. And if I go and try to see that file on GitHub, uh, what you see is, is this. So uh, the MD file is something that GitHub already knows how to render and it shows it as if it was an HTML, but it's actually not. Um, I find HTML like difficult to uh, to read as um, compared to MD files, basically. But anyway, that is the file type that um, I'm going to be using in this series. Um, so now enough about uh, R Markdown. The next thing I want to mention is the toolkit. So R Markdown was one of the tools. Uh, actually, it's not formally part of the tidyverse but uh, the tidyverse is a collection of packages that do have tools for each of those steps in the data science workflow so the very first uh, no so how you use the tidyverse oops sorry actually i didn't mean to do that i clicked on the figure and it popped it it popped it up so if you want to, to learn more about the tidyverse you can go to this url but uh, basically the way you use it is as you use any other package instead uh, the only difference is that instead of attaching just one package it attaches a bunch of packages so if i do library tidyverse you can see that i get a bunch of packages i get the package you know ggplot2 which is the one that i'm going to be talking about in a moment and also i get deployer which is the one that i'm going to be talking next but then you also get a few other packages that are so common in the life or in the day of a data scientist that they are attached by default so in our studio what it could look like so if i'm here in my console and if i type library tidyverse What I get is what you saw on that document again. So I see a bunch of packages, and also I get a, a bunch of warnings that you know some functions may be in conflict between different packages. But that's something I don't want to get on just now. Um, so um, the tool for visualization, which is the one that we're going to be um, using along this series, is called ggplot2. It is one of the many packages that come with the tidyverse, and it is based on. You know, it's, it is a grammar, really. It's the implementation of a grammar in the same way that in English you have specific rules and ways to compose different words and create meaning. The same thing happens with visuals. Someone back in the day, I think in the 70s, wrote the grammar of graphics 
a paper, I believe it is, or a book. And then Hadley Wickham, who is the developer of ggplot2, used that idea and wrote code that implements that idea. So ggplot2 is no more and no less than the implementation, and one implementation of the grammar of graphics. And it's based in, in this very simple idea that you can take data, in this case, represented by a spreadsheet. You can take a coordinate system, in this case, just like an X and Y type of plot. And it's not the only one. There's also radial systems as opposed to, you know, this, uh, you know, like two dimensional one. Uh, but, you know, the default one is, you know, X and Ys. And then, you know, when you map data to the coordinate system with a specific representation of the data, then you get the plot. And this representation in this case is a point, but it could be anything else. It could be a line, it could be you know, a bunch of other things. So those things, those visual representations of your data is, is in ggplot2 is called geoms for geometric representation of your data. So that is the idea. And it is, it is very um, structured. So there is, there is a template. It's so structured that you know, there is this template that you can reuse all the time. So this is how it works. So basically you have to call this function called ggplot and tell it which data set you want to use. In this case, you know, the data set diamonds comes with ggplot2. So it's already available when you attach ggplot by calling library ggplot2. And then uh, you add a new layer by adding the plus symbol here. And then in the other layer, you define the geometric representation that you want. In this case, I want to represent my data with a bar. So I use the geom bar, the geometric representation bar. And then this idea of mappings, which is you know how you map your data to the geometric representation. Okay, there is in the data set diamonds, there is a bunch of columns. In this case, we want to just put the column called cut. So the data set contains a column called cut. We want to put that on the X axis. And that is going to be my columns. So if I do that, you know, I get a plot like the one that you see here on screen. Uh, tomorrow, 20 minutes in. Thanks, Faria. Let's see how much I have to cover. Gplot2, dplyr. Okay, I think I can, I can push through this in about five minutes and leave five minutes for, for questions. Um, so yeah, this is one example of the usage, but you will see that you know, there is a template embedded in that. And this is it. So basically, you always call ggplot with some kind of data, and then you add layers as you want. You can all, you can add as many layers as you want. You can you may on top of these bars, you know, you could represent your data in some other way. So you could in the same plot maybe you can you know plot points and lines one on top of the other. So this is the this idea of the layered grammar of graphics, and uh, the the structure is always some kind of geom function, yeah that allows you to explain how you want to map your data to your um, you know, axes, to your coordinate system. So uh, a little demo here uh, that I would like to do is if I do ggplot uh, data equals diamonds, diamonds, and if I don't add any representation to my data, the plot still works. It's just that the, you know, ggplot2 doesn't know what to put in there, but I still get, as you can see here, this gray area, I still get a plot. I get an empty um, coordinate system, and this type of coordinate system is telling me that the kind of the default coordinate system is, you know, the one that is like, you know, an X and Y. So that is the Cartesian coordinate system. That is why you don't have to explain that in your template, but there is ways to change that coordinate system to something different than the um, Cartesian one. Um, okay, so that's enough for ggplot2. So you're going to be seeing this template over and over and over again. Then there is other functions that you know you will probably learn after this series, uh, but they are not crucial for uh, what we need to do uh, in exploratory data analysis, at least not in this chapter. And then the second tool uh, is the one to transform. Let me go back to the overview here. Remember, so ggplot2 fits here. It's one of the tools to visualize your data. And then the other tool that I'm going to be mentioning now is the tool to transform data. And the tool is called dplyr for data frame. Data frame is this kind of spreadsheet-like type of data structure. Uh, 
that's the name of it in R, it's called the data frame. So data frame player for, as if it was a player, allows you, is a tool for multiple purposes. So that's the name, well, that's where the name deep player comes from. And deep player has uh, a bunch of functions, but there are only a very few verbs, very few functions in the form of verbs that are extremely, extremely useful and allow you to do most of what you will need to do in general as a data scientist, and in particular, all of what you need to do in this uh, chapter for exploratory data analysis. So first, before I show you the, the, the verbs uh, that are super important here, uh, let me show you what the data set diamonds contains. So if I just call data diamonds and print that to the console, what I get is this data set that has a bunch of variables, including, for example, cat, and including, for example, price. So what is the price of a diamond that has ideal cut or has good cut or has you know, premium cut? Uh, so one of the very important verbs that the player contains is the verb select. As it suggests, it allows you to select, in this case, columns from your data set. So remember, uh, you know, there were all these columns. So let's say that you know, we want to take the data set diamonds and select only two columns, cut and price. So this is how you do that. The very first argument of select is the data set, and then any other argument after that, um, you know, you can pass the different names of the columns just as they are. You don't need to add any quote or anything, and DeepPlyer will select them. So instead of you know printing the whole Diamonds data set, here we only print cut and price. So this is one way of using the player, but you can also use it in this other way where you take the data set and you extract it out of the function, put it to the left or to the top, like here, right? And within select, you only use the names of the columns. So this is just another syntax. This weird thingy operator is called the pipe. So you can take diamonds and then select the columns cut and price. So that is, that is how you could word this code. You can explain that, you can read that code actually fairly clearly. So take the data set diamonds and then, this is how you read, then is how it reads the pipe, select the columns cut and price. For a more realistic and more complex example, let's try to read this other code over here. So what we are doing here is we take the data set diamonds and then we select the columns cut and price then we count the unique values of the column cut, and then we filter only the rows where the n column, which is generated by count, is greater than, in this case, 10,000. I, I, here is a typo, right? So notice how readable this is and how much, how well it scales up. There is no limit to how many functions, how many verbs you can use one after the other. It doesn't impair readability. And that is the, the beauty of the pipe. You may or may not like what it looks like, but it is really readable. For comparison, what do I mean by readable? Well, okay, the best way is to probably compare how we were able to phrase that in words, in human words that someone could understand and to see that displayed one on top of the other compared to this other way to do exactly the same, but good luck trying to read this code. So this is the traditional way of composing functions, of creating you know, a complex pipeline of operations by nesting you know, one operation inside the other. So this would be like very normal code only five years ago, but now this is, um, at least in the, in the world, not in so much in the world of creating software, but in the world of actually using software to communicate insights, I think this would be pretty poor writing because it, it, it makes read readability so, so hard. So notice how the output before and after, so these two things are exactly the same just different syntax, um, which is a tool, again, for communication. So again, a data scientist needs to extract insights and communicate it to the world or to themselves. So readability is, is, is paramount here. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this document and close to the end of the meetup, but we still have some time for questions, comments. So please go ahead.
I see Jakub and I'm not sure who was first. I think I saw Jakub first. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, so this is this is related to the pipe. I've been trying to uh, write code using the pipe to make it more readable. Um, but what I don't get, like when you show that example of, of diamonds, um, so you say uh, you always call the data set first, and then you start applying the, the pipe to, to to different functions. Mm -hmm. um, say I wanna I wanna do all these functions to diamonds. I wanna reshape diamonds data set. Do I find another little like a diamond, diamond uh, arrow and then diamond again and then pipe? Or is there like a better way to do that? Say again, because it, I don't know if it, I was the only one, but your voice came very choppy, very cut. Can you say again? So say that you want to reshape diamonds through a pipeline. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, like if I want to shape diamonds, how, how would I do that? Like the, the example you showed based doesn't, doesn't change the data frame, right? But like if I want to change diamonds using those functions, using the pipe, mm -hmm. what's the best approach? Actually, it's good. Um, I'm going to first show it on the console to show you how the thing kind of keeps changing along the way. And then I'm going to use, I understand you code in Python, right? Sorry? I understand that you come from Python, is that right? Yeah, before R, I was in Python, yeah. Good, so I think I could also explain it in a way that makes a lot of sense for Python users, hopefully. So so this is the data set diamonds. Let me show you here on my right, right? So you see how there is a bunch of columns. Uh, so after, the, after select, so I'm gonna select only these few, these two first rows, you see that the, the data set has already changed but it's still a data frame, right? It's, you know, in the, in, in the words of a Pythonist, it's, a, it's an object, right? So I, I created an, a, an object, modified it, and it's another object, but it's, it's still, you know, a data frame object. It just, it has a different shape, right? So now I'm gonna go to the third line. So, I, so now the result of the second line has only two columns and 53,930 rows. And now I'm gonna take that object and apply count, right? So this is what I get now. So I only get a data frame, it's still also a data frame object. It has only two, uh, two columns and has only five rows. The columns are cut and n. So now with that, yeah. I know I, I apply this new function filter to that object. So for you, it could be something like diamonds, you know, dot. If, if this was Python, it would look something like dot select dot count. Sorry if you come from R and you don't, you don't get what's ha happening here. So this is pretty much how you would write this in Python. I know if that makes a little sense now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. I, think, I think the question also may have just been, so, so if you, if you run the pipe on, or on that, that pipeline on diamonds, it's not assigning it to a new object yet. So yeah. it, it, it so runs, it runs the functions, but you would need to then, if, once you're happy with that, you would then either need to assign that to diamonds or assign it to a new object called diamonds reshaped or diamonds with a bunch of shit done to it. Okay, okay, so that that's that answers my question. That's oh, what cool. I wasn't sure about why why when I apply the pipe, why doesn't it not change the object diamonds? But that's because I didn't assign it. I need to assign it again. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Jackson. Yeah, in in R, it's very weird compared to other languages that um, I mean, it has only reference semantics. You know, it doesn't change the underlying object by default so exactly as, as Jackson said you know you could you could rewrite this you know if you will if you want it something like this so see this and I, I do this you know a lot of the time so selected and then you know this could be selected um, count or n right something like this would be what selected but then, you know, these temporary objects that I'm writing here and here, uh, when, when what it matters is the whole pipeline, those objects are kind of hard to name. It's kind of a bit of a pain, you know, you have to come up with names and it clutters your, your kind of pipeline. So, yeah, that, that's the pipe. But again, I mean, that's not the only way to write code. And uh, you, you may use it or not, depending on, you know, what you choose, pretty much. Uh, but that was very. Sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, I was, I was just gonna add to what you were saying. I think maybe like it might be a bit of an advanced tip, but it's like the the pipe is super useful when you're just messing around and want to quickly iterate between like what does it look like if I select this? What does it look like if I check these things? Kind kind of as, as a notebook, like not not necessarily that this is gonna be code that you use, but just for your own understanding of the data, it's really easy to mess around with it. And then when you're happy with the pipeline, and also like when the pipeline does something that you can name easily, like if the pipeline is calculating the average cut or something, when it does something that makes sense and you can name easily, that's a really good time to either save it to a new, a new object, or even better, extract it into a function with the name of that function explaining exactly what that does. And like th th this is kind of it's more advanced. Like this is almost like a, like some, this is kind of like best practices. But it, it, once if you get into that headspace, then you realize like, oh, this like okay, diamond like select diamonds whatever. That's kind of you don't really need a function to do that. I mean, the function is just select, right? You don't need to extract that into into its own module. But if your pipeline is trying to do some logic and trying to do some piece of like analysis. Then a, naming a function that can explain what that analysis is really helps the readability of your code. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so exactly what Mara's done. If once that pipeline does something useful, name it whatever it does that's useful, extract it as a function, and then call it like that. And that way, when you when you go back to look at your code, you don't just have to look at like hundreds of lines of pipe. Yeah. You can look at. You just can see exactly. Okay, this is you know calculating the average whatever. Uh, only. That's why I didn't. I wasn't paying attention to what this pipe does. <laughs> Whatever this <pipe> does. <laughs> We're going to take it though. Anne, uh, Anne is waiting very patiently. Sorry, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> no, thanks. It's super interesting, Laura. Um, just two little questions. So the first one is, um, so now we select the rows and uh, now the columns. How do we select rows? Do we do this with the filter function, or how how do we do this? And then the second one is, um, but Jackson kind of answered it. Like, is it be better? Like, is it best case if I'm doing like pipe extensively long, um, or is it better? Like, is it better to interrupt it with like assigning different steps and then having those steps within the pipe again? Yeah, that's right. So let's answer the second one first. I think. Um, I think, I mean, for you actually coming with such a strong background in communication, I think that could could drive your decisions about when you you want to split the pipeline. So the pipeline is can be infinite, to be honest. So it depends on you where you cut it. There's no like you know hard rule. I mean, people say something like, okay, you know, if you can't fit, if if your pipeline is so long that you know goes over the page. I mean, it's like no one is going to be able to read that. Um, and you're holding so much context in your head. You know, tr you know, the pipeline also allows you to kind of, in a way, run that code on your head and you expect some output, right? But if, 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 if there is so much content, you know, I also know that, you know, from, from kind of cognitive science, you know, humans can't hold more than, what, like seven items at most or maybe some more, some less. So I would say if the pipeline is more than maybe four, five verbs, it's already getting very close to just, I, I don't know what's gonna happen at the end of this pipeline. So that would be my, my very fuzzy rule. Uh, you know, four or five things, something that you know a human can hold in the brain. And if by that time you haven't reached the point that you're able to assign that output to something, uh, to some name, uh, then something is, is wrong there, you know. So let me go back to um, here. So here is where I would say, um, uh, I know, a good name that represents the meaning of this pipeline, right? So if you are reading this code quickly, just this name would more or less summarize everything else in this pipeline. And if the pipeline is very long, very you know, it's very common that you will find a really hard time trying to come up with a name that captures, that summarizes all that has happened in a very long pipeline. Very fussy answer, uh, but that's more or less a uh, touch on, on what you were kind of asking. Yes, that was it. Yeah, yeah. perfect. And then the other one was, remind me, please. Selecting the rows. Ah, rows. yes, exactly. Yeah, the, the verb is, is filtered. So um, 
The, yeah, absolutely. So you, you can read more about how precisely you could do that, but you know, with diamonds, let's do another example. So the diamonds data set say has, um, I don't know, karat uh, or cut ideal premium good. And I could, I could say something like, okay, filter the row. So filter diamonds, so take diamonds, then filter rows where cut equals ideal right and that will just give me the ideal ones and then on top of that i can say comma uh, also where color equals j and something broke there <laughs> let's do something easier to me uh, it's because you it's yeah my color was like uh, british english and not american. ah there you go color Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, that's the, the basic rule, this basic pattern that you could use to, you know, refine your filter call to get specifically the rows that you want. You could be anything, okay? Yes, understand. Cool. Perfect. Any other question or comments? What does table mean? Uh, there was a column, I think, no? Yeah. Uh, I was just playing with what else I could do. Yeah, just an example. Oh, thanks, Marvel. That was super useful. Oh, thank yeah. you all. Uh, went over the time by a lot. Next time, promise we actually start exploring our data. <laughs> if you have data, um, you can also you know bring it on, and maybe we can reflect on the things that we explore on this toy data set. We can probably try something with your data. Uh, maybe not, I'm not sure if during the meetup, but maybe as a discussion afterwards. Thanks, Marvel. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.